right, so today we're going to look at inverse relations and functions, which the majority of this should be a review, but not necessarily all of it. All right, so what is the inverse of a relation? It is a relation that exchanges x and y. That's what's happening algebraically. We exchange x and y, and then that is an inverse relation. Most of the time we end up solving for y so we can graph it. And uh, is a reflection in the line y equals x. So graphically, that's what's happening. Okay, so it's a reflection in the line y equals x. When you graph it, algebraically, x and y have changed places. All right, sound familiar? Hopefully. All right, so notation. If I have um, a relation r, then it is written as r inverse. It looks like r to the negative 1 power. That is not an exponent. Okay. So I have the relation here. It's just a set of ordered pairs. That's all a relation is anyway. So if I want to do the inverse, should be fairly straightforward. My new set, instead of 0, negative 7, I have negative 7, 0. Instead of negative 1, 2, I have 2, negative 1. Instead of negative 4, negative 2, I have negative 2, negative 4. And instead of 6, 3, I have 3, 6. It's that easy. All right, so let's talk about one-to-one -one functions. We know what a function is. We know how to figure out if something's a function graphically and algebraically. So a function has a one-to-one -one relationship if the relation and its inverse are both functions. Okay, not every function has an inverse function. Sometimes when you take the inverse, you don't get a function there. Um, but if you, if you start with a function, you take the inverse, and you end with a function, then it's what's called a one-to-one -one function. So we're going to look at how to figure that out, again, algebraically and graphically. We're going to look at it graphically first. Okay. So this says recall, meaning you already know it, and we already talked about it again, but you knew it before you got here. We have something called the vertical line test. It's used to determine whether a relation is a function, given a graph. Okay, that's old news. We totally know how to do that. So in order to determine if an inverse is a function, I don't have to graph it first. I can use the original function and do what's called the horizontal line test. It's used to determine whether the inverse of a relation is a function. Because all we're doing when we have an inverse is we're reflecting into the line y equals x, so the stuff kind of lays down, so then you can do the horizontal line test and figure out if that works. So both the relation and its inverse must be a function in order to be one-to-one. -one. Right, so graphically, pretty easy to figure out. If you can do the vertical line test, you can do the horizontal line test. So let's look at this. On number one, first of all, is this a function? Does it pass the vertical line test? Yes, so it's totally a function, but that's not what it's asking. That's, but that's step one of me figuring it out. So if it's a function, then I move on to the horizontal line test. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes, that makes it a one-to-one -one function, so the answer is yes. Okay, makes sense? All right, so look at number two. Is this a function? Yes, it passes the vertical line test. So then I move on to the horizontal line test. Does it pass that? No. So the answer here is no. Not a one-to-one -one function. It's a function, but not a one-to-one -one function. Okay? Number three, is that a function? 
Yes, totally passes the vertical line test, right? So it is a function. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes. Same thing is going to happen here, so this one is a yes. Any questions on how to figure that stuff out? All right, then you do four, five, and six. I'll give you a minute to do that. All right, is number four a function? Yes. Is it a one-to-one -one function? Yes, because it passes the horizontal line test. What is this, what is the parent function for this? Cube root, very good. All right, so then number five, is this a function? Yes, it passes the vertical line test, right? Does it pass the horizontal line test? No, because that would be an infinite amount of points there. So this is a big fat no. Number six, is it a function? No, it fails the vertical line test, so I don't even have to go any farther because the first part doesn't even work. Okay, we good on that? Easy enough? Okay, so let's look at what's happening algebraically here. Let's talk about notation. So the inverse of a function f of x is written as the f inverse of x. It looks like f to the negative one power. That is not what that is. Okay, it's not an exponent. And remember, not all functions have inverse functions. To find the inverse function, reminder of these steps, because I know you do this in algebra two. You replace f of x with y, you interchange x and y, then we solve and rewrite it as the inverse. Okay? So our directions say determine if it has an inverse. If yes, find f inverse of x, state any restrictions on the domain. Okay, so we're going to look at the domain restrictions first, because that part is new, um, but it's no big deal. So this is, a, this is a line, right? And so this is what my parent function looks like. Once the slope is changed and um, I go down 8, it actually ends up looking something like this, whatever, something similar to that. So if I want to figure out if the inverse of that has a domain restriction, well, first of all, i got to figure out if this is a one-to-one -one function. Is it? It is, so then I, then I proceed. I need to figure out if the domain of the inverse that I haven't even found yet and don't really know what, lo what it looks like just yet, I need to figure out if there's any restrictions on that. So since I switch x and y, then the domain and range also switch. So if I look at the range of my original function, that's going to become the domain of my new function. Does that make sense? They literally just switch places too. The range here is negative infinity to infinity, so there are no, there are no restrictions. Okay? And that, this range that I wrote down, this isn't necessarily something that you would have to write down every time. You probably want to on your notes. But um, once something you want to at least think about. So I'm writing it down because, you know, you can't see what's in my head. So since the range is all real numbers, the domain of the inverse is going to be all real numbers, and I only have to state the domain if there's restrictions, okay? So now I need to switch x and y, so I change this to y. Then this becomes 4y minus 8 equals x. Then I solve for y, which should be a piece of cake. 4y equals x plus 8. Divide by 4, this is going to give me y equals 1 fourth x plus 2. And that is f inverse of x, no domain restrictions. Yes, ma'am. From here, I switch x and y. That's how you find the inverse. you got to switch x and y and then solve. We good? Anything else? All right, so let's look at number eight. So on number eight, my parent function, this is cubic, so it looks like this. When I, after I transform this, it's going to be vertically compressed, so it just gets squished a little bit, and then it goes down one, so it just looks like that. So what is the range of my original function? Negative infinity to infinity. So that becomes the domain of my new one. I don't have to state it because there's no restrictions. Okay? 
I'm going to change f of x to y, and then x and y switch places. So I'll get 1 half x, no, that's already an x, sorry, y cubed minus 1 equals x. Then after they switch spots, I solve for y. So this will give me 1 half y cubed equals x plus 1. Next, I'd like to get rid of that 1 half. How can I do that? Multiply by 2, every single term. So this becomes y cubed equals 2x plus 2. How do I undo a cube? Cube root. So y equals the cube root of 2x plus 2. Should that have a plus or minus in front of it? No, because it's a cube root, and so that you only have to have the plus or minus for even roots, not odd roots. So that is it. This is f inverse of x. And we knew anyway that since this is a cube, a cube root in the end, our domain would be negative infinity to infinity. But just because you know what the end result is does not mean that it's going to be the domain of what you actually see. That's why we have to have domain restrictions, and we'll see one of those in just a second. Okay, everybody good so far? All right, so let's look at number nine. This is, what is this going to graph? A parabola. And this means I'm going to go to the right four and up six, so it's here somewhere. It's kind of like that. Okay. Is that a one-to-one -one function? No, it's not a one-to-one -one function. I could find an inverse. It has an inverse, but it doesn't have an inverse function. So it says determine if f of x has an inverse. It means inverse function. So I can just say no inverse function. I don't have to do anything else. We're going to skip number 10 because we haven't talked about those graphs yet. Okay. Everybody good so far on everything else? All right, so let's look at number 11. So on number 11, this is a square root function. I know that my square root function looks like this, right? And then this one gets reflected in the x-axis. It moves to the left 2 and down 7. So it's going to look something like that. All right, that helps me. So that is my original function because I haven't done any inverse anything yet. What is the range of this original function? Where do I start? The yeah, this is, the gra this is basically a really crappy little graph of this right here. So what is the range of this function? Negative, where do I start? Infinity and go to negative 7. Got to make sure I get it correct, right? That is my range. Everybody understand that? Do you see how knowing my parent functions and my basic transformations, I can do this really bad little sketch that can help me figure that out without having to do any work? Like, I didn't count. That's probably not, a, that's not even that accurate, but at least you can wrap your mind around then what happened. Okay, so since this is the range of this function, it becomes the domain of the new function, negative infinity to negative 7, because we switch x and y, and domain is x, range is y, okay? I think it's a good idea to do that first so you don't overthink it after you get to the end, okay? Because sometimes it, it can play tricks on you. All right, so let's look at this. I'm going to change this to y, right? Then this is going to give me negative square root of y plus 2 minus 7 equals x. So to solve for y, I'm going to start by adding 7, so I get negative square root of y plus 2 equals x plus 7. How do I undo a square root? Square it. So this is going to give me y plus 2 equals x plus 7 squared. And I think I want to leave it that way, because when it's this, when it's like this, then I can see my transformations better anyway if I need to. Yes? Right, so a negative square root of y plus 2 times a negative square root of y plus 2. Good catch, though. Does that make sense? Because I'm, when I do this, I'm squaring the entire thing. Like that, I just didn't write my stuff down, and so it would make it positive. Okay, good catch. Good catch, though. All right, so then I have, then I need to subtract 2. So y equals x plus 7 squared minus 2. So that is f inverse of x. Now, this should graph a parabola, right? 
but we, we're not going to get a parabola. We didn't start with something that looked like a parabola, right? So I can't get to here and then go, oh, I know the domain of that. That's all real numbers. No, the domain has to be based on the range of this one because what's going to happen here is this function, let's say that I did have a, um, that I did have the whole parabola, and I'm going to do this right here. I have the wrong number in there somewhere. Where, which number is wrong? Oh, minus 2. Like, I know they're not both 7. Sorry, that's a 2. Make sure you have that right. Um, so from here, if I have my parabola, I'd move to the left 7 and down 2, right? And my parabola would look like this. Well, that clearly is not a reflection of this because I got extra pieces, right? That's why my domain has to be restricted. My domain goes from negative infinity to negative 7. It's just this part. And that part is a reflection of this in the line y equals x. You with me? So when we find it, we don't get to use the whole thing. We only get to use part of it because, again, if I had, here's my line y equals x, when I reflect it in there, then it's going to end up looking like that, which is what we had to begin with. Okay? That way you don't have to overthink it at the end or think, oh, it's a parabola. I know what the domain is. No big deal. It matters. We look at it first. Okay? What questions you got? You have a question I can tell. You have a question? Are you sure? Okay. All right, so let's look at number 12. This is an absolute value, so it's going to get reflected in the x-axis, stretched a little bit, and move to the left one. So it's to look something like this. All right? So is this a one-to-one -one function? No, it fails the horizontal line test, so we can just say it has no inverse function. And we don't have to do any work there. What questions you got? All right, 13. That's a cube root. Now, when you look at this, okay, it's a fraction, which makes some of your brains a short circuit, I know. But there's another, there's no variable in the denominator, so there's another way to write this to make the transformations make a lot more sense. This is the same thing as 1 fourth times the cube root of x minus 9. I'll go ahead and set that equal to y. So that, that's just another way to write it, which is totally legal. So this cube root function, it's going to be vertically compressed, which in my sketches you can't tell if that happens anyway, and then moved to the right 9, so it's going to look something like this. right? So what is the range of this function? Negative infinity to infinity. So there are no domain restrictions on the, on the inverse, right? So I don't have to worry about that. So you go ahead and you find the inverse here. You find the inverse of that function. You can use either equation, yeah, whatever you'd rather, because they're exactly the same. Yeah, that's a good question. Doesn't matter either way. Because the work will be, end up being the same too. Done. See if you agree with me. Everybody okay with that? Yeah? Any questions? All right. So let's look at 14. 14, this is a parabola. It's going to be vertically stretched and then down one, so it's going to look something like this, right? Which is not a one to one function, right? But they gave me a domain restriction to start with. They're saying you don't get to use the whole thing. You only get the piece where x is greater than or equal to 0. So it's only this part. So is that part 1 to 1? Yes, that part's 1 to 1. That's good, so we can move on here. And so we're going to make this and then equals y. 
So this is going to give me 3y squared minus 1 equals x. 3y squared equals x plus 1. Then what do I do next? Divide by 3. And since this isn't going to be a line, I'm going to just make this x plus 1 over 3. I'm not going to divide them out because it would make more sense like this when it's not a line. Then what do I do next? Square root. So y equals, what do I write first? Less or minus. Big old square root, x plus 1 over 3. So, so far we haven't done anything wrong, but our answer right here is not good because we got a square root in the denominator, right? So this is the same thing as plus or minus the square root of x plus 1 over the square root of 3. So I think it helps if you write it that way so you don't do weird things. Then we have to rationalize. So I multiply by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. My denominator, square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is 3. When I multiply the two numerators together, you get to multiply everything that's under the square root together. So it's still plus or minus. It's going to be the square root of 3 times x plus 1. And I'm going to leave it like that because as far as my transformations are concerned, I want that 3 factored out so I can see what's going on in there. This is equal to the f inverse of x. And then let's look at what that little graph looks like. All right, so I have a square root function. This 3 can come out as a 1 third, just like we did up there. So it'll be vertically compressed and horizontally compressed, but really none of that matters when my little sketch. So I just take this and move to the left one here. Oh, and you know what I didn't do at the beginning? We talked about it, and then I skipped right over it. We needed to look at, clearly there's a domain restriction, right? We had one to begin with. So my original function, let me go back up there. My original function, which was this, what is the range here? Negative 1 to infinity, right? That is what becomes the domain restriction here, negative 1 to infinity, which you can see right here, right? Same thing. But remember, you can't always just judge on the very end because it, like the other one we had, you want to do it from the beginning, and I didn't do that. We good? What questions you got? Yes, ma'am. Because you always go left to right, least to greatest. And my range, I'm starting down here at negative infinity, going up to negative 7. And you always write them least to greatest. Even if you're thinking about starting here and going down this way, it's always least to greatest, left to right, bottom to top. Okay, good question. What else you got? We good?